प्रीति सर गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर हलेम गुड मॉर्निंग सर हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग सर आपकी आवाज सुनाई दे रही है स्लाइड शो कीजिए सर डॉक्टर हलेम गुड मॉर्निंग सर शायद मेरी आवाज आपको सुनाई नहीं दे रही लेकिन आपकी आवाज सुनाई दे रही है सर डॉक्टर हलेम सर गुड मॉर्निंग आप दिखाई दे रहे हैं अब ये स्लाइड्स स्लाइड्स सर दिया नहीं अभी तक स्क्रीन शेयर नहीं हुआ है अब हो रहा है ओके इट्स इट्स दिया हो गया हाँ आप स्लाइड शो कीजिए हाँ हो गया स्लाइड शो भी हो गया ओके शुड आई स्टार्ट जी जी सो गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर खान एंड टू द पार्टिसिपेंट्स सॉर uh it was uh, not convened earlier so i was not ready uh, let us uh, today's lecture is regarding lichens and environmental sensor how, how we can use lichens in conducting environmental pollution monitoring studies or climate change studies if you see lichens as a, they, they lichens they have some peculiarities one is fungus it is not a single plant it comprises of two symbionts one is fungus we call it mycobind another is algae we call it photobind when they come together being the compatibility between these two they developed uh, about 20000 species uh, of lichens throughout this world so it depends on the type of fungus and type of alga uh, that are involved in lichenization you you can find these lichen these fungi and algae in free state too when when they are in free state they they have perfect shape and size but when they are lichenized when they come and colonize into a lichen form it is very difficult them to be to, to identify whether what type of algae or what type of fungi is involved here so they are unique they are unique in the sense that they have some peculiarities there they are excellent material for monitoring pollution or climate change as in higher plants they do not have leaves they do not have some axis or or stem they do not have root system so what happens but they they feed or they fulfill their water need from the atmosphere itself so in atmosphere weather along with that water vapor if some percolants or some metals are there they are directly absorbed and adsorbed in the thallus because there is no cuticular membrane as in higher growth plants and they do not have they they have very spongy nature because 95% is fungus and only 5% is alga where this vital photosynthesis uh, while vital activity of photosynthesis is going on so whole thallus depends on that 5% of algae which is vital otherwise you you can consider 95% of this lichens as is as inert or of of mycel 
uh, of our mycelial fungi. So these are peculiarities that which make lichens very sensitive and excellent material for environmental pollution monitoring. Again, they live long. They do not shed their organs as in higher group, higher group of plants. There is a leaf fall, but in case of lichen, that thalide body will remain for thousands of years, similar because they are very slow growing. Means if, if a lichen patch is growing, the central part of that lichen will be the oldest one and peripheral part is the youngest one. So they, they grow in, in such a manner that they, they, they do not shed organs. So you can see the cumulative accumulation of metals throughout hundreds of years. Again, some lichens, they have very wide distribution, wide geographical distribution. Means a species, I know I named that species Pixin Cocos. You will find this species, which is most suitable for conducting pollution monitoring studies in tropical areas in, 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 in Tamil Nadu. And you will find that same species found growing in the lower Himalayas. So they have wide distribution. As earlier, I have uh, shown you that lichens, they can grow on tree trunk, means on any living uh, perennial substrate or dead substrate, they have an ability to grow. You can see that they grow on, on trunk, they grow on twigs, they grow on rocks, means it is only the lichen, which is a living organism, which has an ability that it can grow a barren rock. They can grow on dead wood, uh, dead wood. They can grow on soil, they can grow on leaves, they can grow on mosses or any man-made substrate. So depending on their habit, habitat, they are divided into corticolas, ramicolas, saxicolas when they grow on rock. When they grow on dead wood, we call lignicolas. When they grow on soil, we call pericolas. And when they grow on perennial leaves, particularly the pond leaves or, or, or leaves of some pedophytes, they grow in very moist conditions. They grow on mosses, in association with mosses. Even they grow on, on, on some, if some vacuum is uh, standing and it, it accumulates some dust on it, we call them vacuolous lichens. So even they can grow on, on uh, uh, cloth cotton pieces, which are left in higher Himalayan regions by the, by the tourists. Even they can grow on man-made substrates. As I told you that they can grow on historical monuments, buildings, and cause damage to their upper surface. Mostly the lichens, they cause damage. And it is sometimes problem for conservators. The Archaeological Survey of India people, they have some debate whether they should remove these lichens or not. Then if you go to the history of lichen monitoring, it was Darwin. He, 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 he already mentioned that in, nine, in 1790 that lichens fail to grow near smelters. Means their sensitivity is there. He, he recognized, Darwin recognized the sen sensitivity of lichens. Then it's a border, lichen absence where air is impure. Then it was Nylander who systematically studied and uh, observed that lichens co could be used to measure air pollution. And from that period up to now, we have more than thousands of thousand research publications. They are on lichens air pollution monitoring throughout the world. Even this, I will tell you about what, how we, we go for lichen zone map, how we can go for transplant techniques or mapping of all lichens, then how we will calculate or how the, the diversity of lichens, the heavy metals present in them, even their physiology can be used for monitoring pollution in a particular place. In India, it was thus, uh, he first, uh, studied about the uh, lichens in Calcutta city in response to their air pollution monitoring. And he observed that a lichen, he mentioned it, Parmelia uh, caparata, uh, which is growing, uh, which, was not, which was growing in city areas, but it was absent in, in areas which are polluted. Then from 1990 till date, we have worked out different techniques, either it is metabolites, uh, either it is uh, trace elements, metabolites, metals, heavy metals, organic metals, uh, how they are accumulated in lichens at different places or in different cities of our country, including this pH, which, uh, which comes out as, as uh, uh, pollutants from the vesicular activity. This, they, they all are carcinogenic. So I have already told you that with the peculiarities, <clears throat> even these lichens, they have these features, absence of cuticular membrane, we discussed, absence of root system, spongy nature of thallus due to fungal filaments, slow growth rate. 
lichens depend largely on atmospheric deposition for mineral nutrients means they fulfill their water need as well as mineral nutrients from the atmosphere they long live and do not part long term reflection of environmental condition as i told you the cumulative accumulation of metals can be observed in a single lichen thallus uh, with 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 the lichen species so lichens they are three times more sensitive to air pollution than the higher plants and they are the best substrate substances or organisms which can be used for pollution monitoring along with biophytes even i told you about broad geographical distribution allow documentation of a wide spectral pattern they are perennial slow growing uniform again they are capable of accumulating many elements uh, to concentration that vastly exceed their physiological need means certain metals for example nickel cobalt chromium which are lethal for all living organisms they can simultaneously be accumulated in a lichen thallus and lichen will not die so lichens they, they are excellent accumulators they are sensitive they are excellent biomarkers or you can say that lichens are excellent bio indicators or biomarkers or bio um, bio monitoring um, elements as i told you about sensitivity we called it scales of indicator species air pollution to the absence or presence of sensitive species means even if, if there is a smallest speck of acidic gases are there in an environment you will not see lichens over here they are true indicators they very quickly uh, uh, show the da damage within within the morphology within anatomy or physiology means if the concentration of acidic gases is less then you will see symptoms symptoms on the lichen thallus the, the thallus may be built, the thallus may be smaller or protective may be small so they are excellent biomarkers and i told you they are excellent accumulators to a plant or animal species means how much it collects the the other the, the metals means its efficiency so lichens they are excellent biomarkers they are sensitive and they are excellent accumulators and then we have the terms biomonitoring biomonitoring is nothing if we periodically see the changes within a particular species that is biomonitoring periodical and if a particular species is showing changes it is bioindicator that is species may be bioindicator or if you use an index finger and indicate a particular species it is bioindication biomonitoring means it's a periodical changes in a species population or its its frequency or its abundance now if if there are no lichens in in a we, we all know that due to pollution or due to this microclimatic changes uh within 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 city centers we will not find lichens or there are no trees or there are no other uh, perennial substances on which a lichen can colonize so in such places if we wants to do uh, this environmental pollution monitoring what we will do we will collect lichens along with this substratum from a nearby area uh, which has a similar climatic condition and considered as pollution free or having less pollution and shows growth of some lichens in being in india being a tropical country we have luxuriant growth of a particular lichen it is pixine coccus which has been frequently used and frequently grow on mango orchards if you go to a mango orchard you can see that white patches of of these lichens they they can be easily recognized so what we do we take out those patches along with substratum and paste them on cardboards hang those cardboards in leeward direction and uh, towards direction on 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 this uh, chaurahas or in crossings uh, where, where where these roads are there on on crossings or buildings which are facing roads and vehicular pollution so we we count the number of vehicles in a particular uh, street then we we mention we collect the we we we, you know, we take out Uh, these lichens or hold those boards on which these lichens are uh, are uh, are adhered or or pasted and we hold we we hang those uh, cardboards at an altitude at an height of 4 feet and 11 feet because there are certain metals which is scattered high and certain metals which are heavier in their molecular weight particularly if you if you want to see the zinc accumulation and uh, which is due to tire activity or when we applied brake brakes to the vehicle 
this zinc it comes out it will it will not go high it will deposited at the lower uh, heights so it will deposit at 4 feet high but maximum chromium and, uh, and these uh, uh, metals which are lighter in weight they will go high at four, uh, 10 feet or 11 feet so we 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 hope we hang those uh, cardboards carrying lichen substances uh, lichen material and we take out them after one month what happens when lichens are living they accumulate different type of metals when they are dead they still accumulate metals so we take out and we 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 uh, estimate them along with uh, either we use atomic association spectrophotometer uh, spectrometer or we can use different methods are there to know or to estimate metals heavy metals atomic absorption spectrometer we use that one then if you have um, a basic knowledge only to identify which type of lichen is growing whether it is folios whether it is crustose or fruticose so you can map a bigger area so what we, we you can do you you can divide your city into one by one kilometer grid then you start it from the center of the city zero you, you consider it as zero kilometer then you move uh, one direction other direction i will tell you later on then sample of individual lichen species measurement of contaminants accumulated within the thallus for example as i told you that certain species of lichens are there which has very broad geographical distribution you will find growing that lichen in 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 south as well as in himalaya so such lichen species which have a similar morphology of a single species that what type of metals are accumulated at different wide geographical area you can estimate using a single species air quality biomonitoring techniques are there yes floristic ecological surveys evaluation of substrate growth form distribution pattern and document sensitive indicator species then you you will have that that is the passive monitoring we call it means if you go to the field itself go for ecological for example if you if you study the lichens of a particular forest type means and you see that it has dominance of of crustose lichens means crustose lichens are the primary colonizers so we can say that this forest is reason red one as it has mostly the dominance of crustose lichen but similar forest which is nearby if it shows the dominance of fruticose and folios lichens if they are growing here means that climate is suitable for them it is the climax stage of that forest so with the help of these floristic studies in a particular forest you can tell that this forest is whether regenerated or this forest has an old ecological continuity then evolution of substrates evaluation means the the substrates whether this, this is growing on on bark or if it is growing on on as epiphytic or if it is growing on on soil or rock or whether the dominance of lichens which are growing on soil and rock they show their dominance it means that these lichens are tolerant and you, you do not have sensitive species again growth form again according to growth form the the fruticose lichens or which are which are hang pendulously they are considered as more sensitive to pollution than the lichens which are growing as crushed on on soil or on rock even their distribution pattern so these are the methods we call them passive monitoring active monitoring what we do we go for transplant as i told you that in the city centers mostly in india we do not have lichens so what we do we go to a nearby area collect lichens along their substratum and paste them on, on hard boards hang those hard boards in different chaurahs or in different places where we want to know the pollution level then measurement of various physiological parameters means the photosynthetic activity cellular respiration protein synthesis nitrogen fixation membrane permeability these are again the methods by which we can monitor or we we, which we can say that what was the level of pollution in a particular area this is the way how how means in case of uh, uh, angiosperms we use a quadrant but in case of lichens uh, for floristic or ecological study surveys we we need this type of quadrant what we do we we uh, to frequency density events and and various indices we we take a one by one fit by one fit of this uh, quadrant then further we divide it into one by one uh, inches or centimeter it depends on the type of of quadrant which you need then you see the coverage area of that particular species uh, within that quadrant so evaluation of substrate growth and distribution pattern and document sensitive indicator species we we can we, we have an ability or we can we can go for dividing a, a city into different zones how how we have done this 
means if there is no lichen within the central region where there's most polluted one or, or microclimatic conditions is very, very dry, very heavy vacuolar activity, you will find no lichens growth over there. So what we have calculated that in Lucknow city, we divided Lucknow city into one by one kilometer grid. And we, 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 we find out that within the diameter of uh, nine kilometers, we do not have lichens. That area is considered as the most polluted uh, and, and, uh, and followed by the area outer transitional zone where we have seen growth of few lichens, uh, presence of some caligulous lichens which grow on monuments because they have an inbuilt tolerance to fight against the acidic gases. So we, that transitional zone is there. Then, then comes the scarce growth of few clusters or polios lichens. Then there is a normal zone, means where you will find, find luxuriant growth of lichens. One, one person, uh, somebody can ask me a question. Uh, we, we have machines. We have machines to, to know about the pollution level in a particular 3D. Then what is the use of these lichens? So the answer is, we cannot fix that machine into too many places on a single place, they are there. Then we cannot see what is the biological damages going on, on on the living organism with this pollution through machines. So, and if if this is this is a very, very crude method, you can say an easiest method to map a city uh, with the absence and presence of lichens about its, its environment, its uh, pollution level at different zones. That's why it's called lichen zone mapping. Zone mapping, normal zone, different fruticose, folios, crustose lichens, level of percentage. Now you can see that it is 70 to 900 percent. Number of species in every sample is 10, 10 or more. Outside resistance zone, few folios and many. So level of coverage within a uh, zone can be can be calculated with, with this study. This is the way. You can see that there is a there is a cardboard with lichens. We have hanged it in 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 the Calcutta area where we do not have. Or even you can go. We have hanged this uh, cardboard in, in on a pole because trees were not there. So what we do? We hang cardboard along uh, containing lichen samples at the top 11 feet and at the base at four feet, as I told you. So this is the way how we take out lichens along with their substratum from the um, pollution free area or which we consider oh this is our skirt of the city and if we see growth of lichens then we can use them lichens and they we, even we can fix them on on trees and you can see that this white growth this is all fixing cocos as i told you is the most frequent tropical lichen which can be used for pollution monitoring studies as biomarker or then we spray then we can even we can paste them on, on, on tree in our laboratory, near laboratory, then we can give different concentration of, of chromium, nickel, uh, whatever you, you want, uh, the accumulation of that metal in lichens. So lichens, where they, they can be used, they can be uh, potential air pollutant elements uh, for, for, for uh, biomonitoring of thermal power plants. Uh, we all know that it is NOx gases in the steel industries, in petroleum refineries, metals, smelters, fertilizer plants. So these are the different primary pollutants. We all know CO, NO, CO2, NO2. Secondary pollutants, yes, sulfates and, and acids, as well as of four. And what happens? What happens means these NOx and SOx gases, they are very much soluble in water. So along with the few, this SO2 or NO2, it forms an acid. This is a weak acid, S2SO3, which further breaks into H plus HO3 ions. These H ions, you all, we all know they are reducing. What they do, they when they are higher in concentration or if the pH is very high, they reduces the manganese present in the central of the chlorophyll and liberate into free state. And chlorophyll A, if, if the concentration is less, chlorophyll A, B, there is slight change. If concentration of acidic acids is less, the lichen shows morphological symptoms. And if it is high, then what happens? It reduces the magnesium present in the center of the chlorophyll, convert green chlorophyll into pheophytin, which is a brown pigment. So the process of photosynthesis is skizzes and plant started dying. If concentration of H is low or, or pH is, is, is not that much high, then what happens? The plant shows bleaching, reduction in thalassite, 
these all are mostly the morphological changes within that lichen. We all know about these persistent organic pollutants. There are about 16 pH, which are known as carcinogenic, and it was uh, uh, it, they, they are considered as carcinogenic and as mentioned by the U.S. Pollution Control uh, authorities that they are they are coming out into the environment through molecular activity. We, we cannot see them, but they are there. So lichens have an ability that even they can accumulate these metals. And in a particular place, if we if we estimate uh, the lichens uh, for these pure, we, we can uh, tell something about the pollution level of that area. So what happens in our cities? Mostly we have this heavy molecular activity, and uh, and uh, we 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 use this uh, lichen uh, as I told you about lichen fixing cocos. Uh, you can see that through this whole India, we have used uh, that particular fixin cocos and some other lichens to, to know the concentration of different metals, uh, state-wise or region-wise. In 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 uh, the iron is is mostly mostly show higher level of concentration in lichens. Why? Because lichens they have certain chemicals which has affinity towards the uh, iron metals. So iron which is coming out as agriculture practices along with the along with this soil it comes to the to lichens and it accumulated show the accumulation of iron is highest then lead which which earlier was used as as was coming from molecular activity cadmium you can see that in the central part where the the, the there is mining or there is uh, uh, more uh, more type of this red soil is there chromium cadmium they show their uh, luxuriance. Even even the lichens which are growing on on mines along mines, they have magnesium concentration higher, nickel. So within this whole Indian sub different regions, we use lichens to know what are the concentration of which metal is higher at that region. In uh, in in localities uh, West Bengal, what we we have so far done means uh, I will tell you there is a lot of scope to do such type of studies in different localities because we have only concentrated in West Bengal, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Himalayas, and uh, we, we do not have such studies from, from Southern India. Uh, some, so what we have done, we, we, we worked on the point source and area source. We, we took to, uh, together these factors, behavior of lichens, whether that lichen is hyperaccumulating or how it accumulates and what are the arsenic species and means which type of arsenic it accumulates? We, we have worked on those aspects too, and we have published those data and to these uh, journals. So even even the uh, even the PCA is is important to, to know uh, means particular for for a particular area of uh, the lichens they they will tell you that where is the heavy polluted zone uh, which is the moderate polluted zone or if it is the site which do not have much pollution. Such type of studies we have carried out at Maharashtra and Panchangani area. Uh, that area is famous for its tourist, uh, being a tourist place. So using lichens, uh, we, we have uh, used this PCA and, and separated that area. Using one lichen is a remeter or trachina. Uh, earlier it was a hypotrachina species to know pollution level at different places. So we, we have worked out, uh, again, there is a lot of scope that uh, the metal accumulated on, on lichens, uh, which are growing along the um, national thermal power plants, because along with this phi ash, a large number of trace elements or other heavy metals, they, they, they come out and they, they spread uh, all along the areas and they are cons uh, responsible for or uh, lung diseases, or bronchitis, or, uh, or diseases with respiratory system. So, how much area a lichen uh, um, means, uh, means the, the effect of that NTPC is there? It can be calculated with uh, or studied with lichens. What we have done all around this NTPC, five kilometers, ten kilometers, fifteen kilometers, we collected lichens and we measured the concentration of different metals. Uh, whether it is decreasing or it is increasing, where, what type of metal is there in all the four sides. Then considering the, the, the air direction, which is the air direction. So we have again published this one in the Journal of Hazardous Material. So we, we know that nowadays there is a use of these computational uh, techniques or, or there are certain programs 
so uh, in in computer also uh, one program is quick toggling means it it will tell you that if you have a, a data of one the average and a moisture of this one or precipitation of this one how much it is accumulated in that particular how much concentration of that particular metal is accumulated uh, and and what will be the changes so unstable work. what will be the changes dr halim it's audible hello may i audible dr khan i am audible hello sir you are audible sir okay, we can okay. hear you yeah because there was some uh, break here na no? okay so i was talking about uh, the creek ogling it is a it is a computer program with the help of this program if you you can calculate or if if you have an uh, if an idea about the concentration of a particular metal in at a particular altitude and within a particular species you can you can predict that how much it will be at different altitudes or even the whole uh, area uh, district area of that region as i told you that lichens because uh, you, you have heard about uh, badrinath a, a holy pilgrimage and what happens um, during the summer a large number of vagals they fly on that route and as i told you that ph polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons they are coming out into the environment through this vacular activity so we have studied whether where where this ph go whether they they accumulate more in valleys or they go up to the higher places or the ridges so utilizing the lichens we we calculated that these ph which are having high molecular weight because they are uh, these ph may be two ring three ring four ring or six ring so mostly the six ring ph polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons they they accumulate in higher concentration into the into the valleys why are the 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 lighter one having two or three uh, ph uh, ring uh, ph they go and accumulate more in at higher ridges so with the help of lichens even we can tell uh, or, or we can predict about the the concentration of ph at different uh, altitudes as i told you uh light uh, uh, the lichens they have an ability that they can accumulate everything so whether it is metal metalloid trace element heavy metals organic inorganic even radionuclides but recently uh under this international mission for nitrogen mission uh, program uh, it was observed that the himalayan region and the plains of india has highest nitrogen concentration so what happens this nitrogen when it
सर आपने आप, आपको अनम्यू अनम्यूट कीजिए सर आप म्यूट हो गए और आपका स्क्रीन भी शेयर नहीं हो रहा है इट इज देयर नाउ यस सर नाउ इट इज ओके 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 सो पर्टिकुलरली क्लाइमेट फॉर क्लाइमेट चेंज इन स्टडीज इफ यू यूज हायर प्लांट्स इट टू इट टू thousand thousands of years uh, past records but it is easier with lichens we can we can go for this herbarium uh, we, we can use herbarium material if it is well well labeled if it is well mentioned about its locality about its G- gps system or gps locations uh, we we can use herbarium material we can go for this lichenometry because this is a a technique uh, where we can measure the diameter of a lichen Uh, we know the the growth rate of that particular lichen because it grows on exposed rocks when the glacier melts and it goes back the rocks they are exposed and a particular type of lichens have an ability to colonize on that one we know that in in this particular harsh condition this lichen grow only 1 mm in 100 years so with the with the age growth of lichens we we can know the age of that substrate when it was exposed so this is particularly lichenometry and lichens of in, uh, indian himalayan regions they are best material to to carry out climate change studies so how we how we use herbarium you can see that in in case of lichens the herbarium packets are a little bit different with the angiosperms you can see that we can paste them on on hard boards and you, you can see on my left that the date is 66251 it means that this lichen was collected in 1966 from darjeeling area and the locality is mentioned and the altitude is like mentioned this lichen packet is preserved in our herbarium so what we have done we revisited this area and again we revisited the place from where this lichen was collected if you see on my right in 2014 we have able to collect the same species from the same locality and we 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 compared the metals what metals are there what metals are now what was the human activity was there what is now what is the what was the climatic data or or meteorological data at the time and what is the meteorological data today so we we considering all these ones then we have studied the species shift the particularly these are the metals which were in 2000 which were in 1966 and metals in 2000 Fourteen, the pH in two thousand in nineteen sixty six in the same species the pH today, and we we have all the localities data the the particularly the uh, pH at different localities in both the places, and meteorological data. We after an interval of ten year ten years we 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 saw that what happened during this last fifty years that locality which has very high precipitation. which has very low temperature it has five fold more means the temperature rises five times the the, the precipitation uh, uh, remove, uh, reduces five times the concentration of metals metalloids or even the uh, even the uh, it increases five times so it is it is well documented how डॉक्टर खान यस सर आपकी तरफ से हाँ अब आ रहा है फिर से मैं वो आपकी कंपनी जो लड़का है उनको मैं एसएमएस कर रहा था व्हाट्सएप में किया
आपका आवाज नहीं आ रहा है सर सर आपका आवाज बिल्कुल सुनाई नहीं दे रहा Dr. Khan, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, now you are uh, audible. Okay, okay. I was talking about the the uh, lichen species means they have some uh, special morphological characters which are similar in uh, within within different taxa, and we 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 use those communities, and um, we we have the sixteen such communities for India which can be used to to tell you or to predict the. Uh, age structure, even even the condition or health of a forest. So for example, this example, if you take calisiod lichens, calisiod means they, they are lichens having um, fruiting bodies of major deer type or raised uh, stock within them. Uh, if they are luxuriantly growing in a forest type, we can predict that this forest has ecological continuity or it is not, not the disturbed forest. So such type of lichen communities we, we, have, uh, we have made for Indian lichens and it is already published in, in Nature Science report. As I told you about lichenometry, this is particularly the characteristic feature of lichen, which are slow growing. As I told you that certain species of lichens are there, which are very slow growing. They grow a millimeter in 100 years. Even if you can see a old building, which is about 60 years old, and some lichens are growing over there, and they are, they are forming a circular structure. And if you know the age structure of that building, that it was erected 60 years before, then you can correlate the growth of lichens. Means if you identify that lichen, you measure with a Verna caliper, then you can predict that, that this particular lichen grow this much growth in three centimeter in 60 years. So this type of reference we can take with different lichen communities. It was known that this yellow lichen, Rhizocarpon geographicum, grows one millimeter in 100 years. And what happens when the glacier retreats? It, it, the, 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 the big boulders and rocks they are exposed. It is only the Rhizocarpon geographicum and some other circular structured lichens have an ability that they can colonize on a barren rock. So it grows over there, and such glaciers. If you see this glacier. This is Tajwas Glacier in, in, in um, Kashmir. We have worked out there along with Indian Space Research Organization and we calculated that the glaciers mostly uh, they reduces or they retreated one kilometer in about 675 years. Whether it is in, in Himalaya, in, in northern Himalaya, 
but the speed of glacier retreat is faster. We have calculated the glacier retreat is faster in eastern region. So this is the way how we go. We take the uh, uh, diameter of lichens uh, uh, one kilometer away from that glacier snout, from the glacier uh, snout is there. And we, we calculated that after 550, 50 meters interval, there is a correlation. Means the diameter of lichen on the boulder, which is one kilometer away, will definitely have bigger shape and bigger diameter than the lichen, when then the lichen which is growing near the glacier snout. So we, we calculated that one and we have done similar studies in, in, in Eastern Himalaya and in Western Himalaya. And we, we call this method lichenometry. This is the way how we, we measure the diameter at different places. And after an interval of 50 meters, then we go climb towards the glacier snout and we calculate the glacial retreat space with this method. This is two methods are there. One is direct method and is indirect method. A collision is established between the size of the lichen and surfaces based on lichen measurement from surface of known grave stones or stone walls. As I told you about that, how the lichens uh, that, that can be used as a reference if you know the age of the that particular building or that particular uh, monument which was erected there. So I, I told you about that, how this area or how this Eastern Himalaya, it, it has faster glacier retreat than the Western one. We, we calculated it with help of these lichens. We are involved with the one program with Indian, uh, one uh, with the Indian Space Research Commission, uh, which is going for uh, to study the uh, to study the climate change or glacier retreat and, and tree line movement in Indian Himalayan region in all the five states uh, of uh, India. And they what they have done, they have established some uh, permanent plots at 3,000 meters, 3,500 meters, and 4,000 meters to see the species shift. And under this program, uh, Himandri, they call it, all the vegetation which is present now at five meters, they, they mentioned it, they observed it, they recorded it, and at 10 meters. So this will be a record for further studies after. And they, they, they established or they placed some sensors at four directions, western, southern, eastern, and western, north part. So they, they, they fixed these sensors. One is for precipitation, another one for temperature, and they are linked with a satellite. So they have also developed the spectrum of the vegetation which is growing there with the help of that satellite. Now, a person who is sitting at Ahmedabad can see what are the changes in temperature, precipitation are going on after within a period of one hour and what is the changes going on on the vegetation through that spectrum at 56 places at sitting at Ahmedabad. So he will continuously, they develop such data for next 20 years because the sensors, they will work for next 20 years and they will predict how much changes are there or how much uh, forest tree line has moved forward and the glacier or the, how the mountain caps, they, they are dissolved. Such type of studies we have carried out in Tungnath area of Chamoli district uh, with ISRO. Uh, means this, is the, uh, this is the way how they fix the uh, precipitation and uh, temperature uh, sensors in these places. You can see that this is the way they, they select a higher summit point, then within five kilometers, they fix these uh, sensors on, on the four uh, sides of that, uh, that cap or that altitude and at 4,000 meters and 3,000 meters, 3,500 meters and 4,000 meters. This is the place for, or for uh, this sensor or data logger for temperature and precipitation. These are the lichens when you go in Himalaya, uh, you will, will encounter such type of lichens because they are very dark colored because they have to develop certain anthraquinones and other chemicals to protect the algae from UV effect. And to, to develop their uh, this, uh, uh, hypostructural uh, figures or, or uh, the, the data from, uh, data from uh, or spectra from of these lichens is quite easy. You can see that how these they can be visible uh, through satellite because the satellites are very powerful. Even it can uh, the, the ultraviolet satellites they can even view 
but is growing in the ground and in within a diameter of three millimeter. This is how we have shown that within this five meter, what will the species uh, communities are there today, and how they will, uh, what are there within ten meters, and after twenty years, how this community changes will be there, and it can be correlated with the uh, with the uh, meteorological data. So, what is next? We we should. As I told you that there is a lot of scope to develop these zone maps, uh, not only in city areas, in protected and sanctuary areas. Isolation, standardization of indicator or tolerant species, as I told you that we have pixie in cocos, which can be used. Then exploring gene, which are responsible for hyper accumulation of specific pollutant. As I told you that lichens, they are excellent accumulators and they, they can be used. They, they, the, what is the, the genes which are responsible for that? Then markers, we can go for them to, to know the metalloids or POPs, RDFTY secondary metabolites, which may be used in pollution monitoring uh, as certain chemicals, uh, which, which protect the, the algae from UV, such type of chemicals. They can be go for bioprospection or for commercial use, preparation of standardized protocols. Still, they are not there for biomonitoring, uptake and accumulation behavior of lichens against radionuclides. Nobody has worked out on this aspect. Uh, either there is a great spoke to work on this aspects to long-term monitoring program of this Indian Himalayan region along with this um, area. There, there is a, a good, good scope uh, which will go further up to 20 years. So long-term monitoring, this is uh, what we have now planned, what we are working on, on what are the altitudes, bet, uh, lichens growing between 500 meters, 2000 meters, between 2000 meters, 2500 meters, altitude between 2500 and 3000 meters, so on to, to what, the present uh, scenario of lichens within these altitudes, how it will change uh, will be a record for uh, further studies uh, regarding climate change. This is all uh, long-term climate change studies, means functional taste, we need, um, we need habitat, habit, thallus color, fruiting bodies, thallus biomass, chemistry presently, then organic, inorganic, metals or meteorological data. For long-term climate change studies, we need such uh, parameters with us. And even we, we are going for this uh, open top chamber establishment in Indian Himalayas with help of uh, Wildlife Institute, Dehradun. And uh, you can see these open top chambers are nothing but they are six hexagonal plates covered with a transparent sheet. Uh, they are fixed in, uh, in higher altitudes at 4,000 meters in Badrinath and uh, that area, Gangotri area, you can see that this one is the control one and which is enclosed in open top chamber. It has two degree temperature higher uh, than, than the open, open area. So this temperature we will get after 70 years. We all know that the temperature will rise and what will happen to the vegetation which is there, you, you can see or you can study at this time is to changes in lichen communities to this large performance and qualitative and quantitative changes in amino acids and secondary metabolites, what will happen to these lichens if we can study that. This one. So it is all adaptation study. We know that due to these SOX, NOx gases or high greenhouse gases, well, lichens, they, they first go for shifting. When they shift, they have to acclimatize. For acclimatization, they need to change their phenotypic changes. They, they have to develop certain colors within their upper part to, to protect the alga. So for that particular phenotypic changes, they have to, their inner uh, influence cellular activity, which change the mode of reproduction. We all know that the adapt for acclimatization to adaptation, it took straight hundreds of years where the genotypic changes are there. So this such studies can be done uh, with the help of lichens in higher Himalaya, particularly the lichen species which are growing on soil at buffer places, buffer zones, means between uh, alpine or subalpine regions, the lichens which are growing on soil, they very easily show the changes or shift and acclimatization within them. Uh, even uh, the, the, uh, the amino acids, uh, which are called mass, they are excellent source uh, to, 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 to measure or to estimate, and they are further uh, utilized for their commercial use as uh, anti-UV creams. The lichen compounds, again, they show uh, there is a change or accumulation or uh, if you go for their uh, quantitative uh, measurement, uh, uh, they show a increasing trend uh, uh, together with altitude. When the altitude increases, there is more uh, UV is there, so more production of 
sacrifoids and lichens so in future we have 3m the first is measurement just measuring the, the the tree line movement or the glacier retreat then monitoring yes we can go for forest monitoring then then we we have to develop certain models so for this particular forest if if you have to go for biomonitoring in in tropical rain forest western guards we have we have certain different models then if you go for modeling in in rajasthan or in in uh, marine zone areas so this is the proposed uh, proposed model the like is if you go for their documentation past her behavior records authentication or if we revisit and authenticate then we, we can come to the common species or genus how how the diversity analysis are there how it is changed what is the present level or past level of pollutants within that species then indication of changes or this is the comparison of past and present or the, the first one is identification so this is all the model we have proposed thanks a lot any questions any query please thank you so much sir for the wonderful presentation uh, thoroughly it was uh, shown how the lichens can be the one which can help in monitoring the pollution and the change in the environment uh, but uh, what is the role of this amino acids in the lichens okay they 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 are quenching material they they quench they quench the uv effect particularly uv b or uv a uh, a effect we all know that it damages uh, the the algal cells algal cells uh, since mostly the amino acids or ma which we call microsporin like amino acids is produced by cyanolichens cyanolichens they do not produce too much of secondary metabolites that's why In in case of chlorolichens, which has green uh, alga involved in lichenization, they produce a vast array of secondary metabolites, which can sometimes act as a screen to protect them from UV. But in case of cyanolichens, uh, the secondary metabolites are not produced uh, of that quality or of that standard. So this amino acid has to play the role, and they act as a quench to 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 uh, to, to act as a screen to to uh, reduce the UV effect. Uh, in in cyanolichens, this is amino acids. This is the way they produce. For the first time in Indian lichens, we we have uh, measured these uh, or estimated these amino acids uh, mass in Indian lichens. Uh, so uh, it was published in um, journal Amino Acid. I think uh, it's a good publication or the first publication in on amino acids of lichens which act as uh, quench to to quench the UV and do these amino acids vary in the species wise yeah it is there it is there as i told you that for example if a species is growing at low altitude the the quantification of that particular compound will be less but if you move upwards the same species you collect uh, a different height or upward height where the uv is high again the the quantification will is the amount will increase thank you so much for wonderful presentations on both the topics what we have seen thank you so much sir thank you thank, thanks a lot gracing us blessing us for such a wonderful talks sir thank you so much thank you thank you thank you it was a little bit delay i apologize for that sir sir you don't repeat sir because it's sir. <laughs> it's okay sir sir thank you thank you so much okay thank you thank you for joining us on behalf of department of botany uh, telangana university and the team of uh, this refresher course teacher participants who have come over here to join, uh, uh, attend your lecture uh, everybody express their deep sense of gratitude for uh, presentation thank you so much sir uh, belavadi sir can you start uh, sir you have to stop the sharing of screen upriti sir yeah i am there i am there screen share band kijiye acha now sir aap shuru kijiye you you can start now sir yes sir morning sir welcome back again yeah uh, i'll share the screen first yeah sir
Yeah, I'll be, uh, shall I start? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll be speaking today on fossils. Yeah, most awaited uh, talk from you. Yeah. You were very eager to know how many fossils are there in the Yeah, India. that's what, yes. So oh. I, I thought I should speak on fossils. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Um, and we know that fossils are important for understanding evolution and evolutionary relationships. Um, this is, the, you, you, were, you were ask, also asking whether fossils have been found in India. So I will start with Indian uh, thing first. So this is Narmada River. Uh, and we know that on the banks of Narmada recently, um, one of the tallest statues have been erected of Sardar Balbai Patel. This is also part of the uh, Statue of Unity. Uh, and very close to this, uh, you, uh, before that, the Narma, Narmada River, it starts from somewhere in Madhya Pradesh near Jabalpur, and then it goes through the uh, through Gujarat and then joins the Ar Arabian uh, Sea. So on the uh, track of Narmada on either sides, there have been deposits of uh, fossils. Fossils have been found in the in this place. There are many places where they have, they have found insect fossils, there are, they have found some other fossils also. So I'm going to tell uh, something very interesting about this. So not far from Sadar Patel's statue, statue that is Kavadia, there is a place called uh, Rahioli, a village Rahioli, where there is a limestone quarry, which is owned by the ACC cement factory on the banks of Narmada. Now, the workers working in this uh, 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 quarry, they found some very interesting spherical objects sometime in 1980s, which are larger than a football. And this became a collector's item and then they used to collect it and then keep in the office uh, of the uh, ACC uh, limestone quarry office. And they, they used to show to people who were uh, visiting. And these were the uh, things. And this big day is started calling it as cannonballs. And these, uh, in, in fact, the Geological Survey of India came to know about it. And then they sent two geologists Vivedi and Mahabe, Mahabe in November 1981 to examine what these are, these cannonballs are. And Mahabe visited the location again in the March 1982 and collected some of them. Uh, this, this is the place. The, in October 1982, Mahabe met Dr. Ashok Sahni, a paleontologist. In fact, there was a meeting of paleontologists happening in Ahmedabad, and Ashok Sahani had come there, and then uh, and Mohabe told about these cannonballs to Ashok Sahani. He didn't know what, what they were. And Sahani got interested and decided to visit the site again with uh, Ashok Sahani, with uh, Mohabe, and he suspected that the cannonballs could be the eggs of a dinosaur. So this was something very interesting that nobody knew that dinosaurs were there in India uh, and they found uh, a fossil, fossilized egg of a dinosaur in 1982, in 81 and 82. And in 1983, Ashok Sahani along with Suresh Srivastava, another uh, GSI uh, geologist, they came again and then they searched for dinosaur eggs and then the nests of dinosaur. They collected many eggs several bones and a peculiar skull also. And they made detailed map of their findings, deposited these collections. This is the skull that they found in, uh, in that place. And they deposited all the collections in the G GSI museum in Ahmedabad. So this was, they, this was done in 1983. And the whole thing was forgotten for nearly 20 years. And in, it was only in 2001 that Paul Serrano and Jeff Wilson from Michigan University, they, were, they are the uh, well-known paleontologists, and they came to know about this, and then they decided that they should visit uh, this, these collections and then study them. So in June 2001, they came uh, to study the collections made by Srivastava and Sahani to India, to Gujarat, and they started connecting the bones that they had collected. So they, they connected, connected the bones and reconstructed the full dinosaur. So the connecting the bone, they, they might not have got all the bones, but they would have got some major bones. And the remaining bones, usually what the paleontologists do when they, were working, when they are working on uh, fossils is that they actually uh, make some 
um, plaster of Paris casts, and then they connect the bones and then make the full, full organism. So that is how they actually made the full uh, dino. And they were shocked. They had a brand new species of dinosaur before them that measured more than 30 feet long. And they also realized that it must have been a carnivore. And they later on, they uh, actually dated this carnivore, this dinosaur to be about 65 to 99 million years old. So that is the age of the dino dinosaur, that the fossil that they had. And uh, they have actually published this in 2003. It's a very interesting paper, Serino et al, for which even Srivastava and Sahani are also uh, authors for this paper. Now, this is the dinosaur, which they have named as Rajasaurus narmadensis. This is, this is the sole species in the genus Raja, Rajasaurus. So this is the one which has been found in India, a dinosaur which roamed the, probably uh, uh, on the banks of Narmada uh, River in central India. Now, some questions to ponder. What did the, uh, the scientists actually find on the banks of Narmada? They have actually found the fossils, fossilized the eggs, fossilized bones of, and the skull of the dinosaur that later on was determined as a new um, species. Okay. And they actually assembled the complete animal using few bones and the skull. And as I said, they also usually make the casts, the plaster of Paris casts, and then prepare the entire, entire dinosaur. And they guessed that the dinosaur was a carnivore by looking at the shape, size, and the structure of the teeth. In, in, the, in the skull that they had found. Okay, so based on that, they could actually find that they were, the, the dinosaurs was a carnivore. And the question of how they guessed that the dinosaur was 65 to 99 million years old, we will find, I'll tell you uh, in the future slides, how the methods that they follow. So before that, what is a fossil? A fossil is an impression, a cast, original material, or track of any animal or plant that is preserved in rock after the original organic matter is transformed or completely removed. So this may take millions of years for a fossil to be formed. It may take millions of years. And it may be just the impression of the structure of an animal or a plant, or it may be a cast. It may be the original material, like the bone itself, bones of uh, higher animals or the exoskeleton of insects may be completely uh, preserved uh, or the track of an animal. That means if the animal has moved on a surface and if that surface is uh, preserved undisturbed, then the track of the animal or the footprint of the animal or the plant also can be uh, preserved. Now, <clears throat> when I say, when we say impression, it may be an impression like this. This is an impression of an extinct farm. farm. So the, the impression is, it, it remains on a rock. The rock is still forming. In the formative stage of the rock, this fern must have got caught there. And then when the rock has completely solidified, completely it became solid, it, the impression has remained on that. So this is one thing which we commonly see. Even insect impressions may be seen like this. This is a damselfly impression of a damselfly. Or the it may be preserved in what are called as amber. So here you see an insect preserved in an amber. And this is the fossil of an Archaeopteryx, which is the earliest bird. Now coming to bones and skeletal remains, the entire skeleton of an organism may be preserved. For example, there are many places where the entire dinosaur is found. The entire skeleton of the dinosaur is found. So it is no more a bone. The bone shape is retained and the bone is completely converted into rocks. So each piece is, is a rock and it is the structure of the bone. So the, the transformed, it, it is transformed to rock. So uh, this, is, this is a sea animal, okay, a mollusk, which is caught in a, in a molten rock, and then the rock is solidifying, and the whole organism has become a rock. It has transformed itself into a rock. So this kind of fossils are also very commonly come across. Now, the study of fossils and other historical remains of life that lived on Earth long back is referred to as Paleo, paleontology. Okay, so if you are talking about uh, the 
historical remains of insects or fossils of insects, we call it as paleo entomology. So when I was pronouncing paleontology, it came automatically as paleo entomology. So it is paleontology. So what do fossils tell us? Fossils give clue about organisms that lived long ago on this earth. So which probably do not exist at all. There may be fossils of extant animals also, but mostly we will be concerned about fossils of extinct animals to link the extant animals. They provide evidence about how Earth's surface changed over time also. And it, the fossils help scientists to understand what past environments may have been like. So all this information we get from fossils. So why we have to study fossils? For reconstruction of the ancestral ground plants, that means the relatedness of the animals or how the evolution has occurred, recognition of primitive and derived character states of, of a particular group of animals, let us say, detailed analysis of organs of living forms with respect to their homologs in other arthropods, um, which are extinct now. Then comparative morphology of fossil records also is important. And the, so this gives the basis for phylogenetic inferences. So how, uh, supposing if we are constructing the phylogeny of a group, if we have fossil records, we can actually find the missing links in the phylo phylogeny. So fossils become the missing links in the phylogeny, in understanding the phylogeny of a group. Now, how, the, how a fossil is formed? So the first and the foremost uh, thing is that an animal or a plant is buried in a sediment, such as volcanic ash or silt, sh shortly after the animal dies. So immediately after the animal dies, uh, it should be completely covered by um, a sediment. So that is, and, and are protected from rotting by the layer of the sediment. So it is protected by the layer of sediment uh, so that uh, the, it, it does not rot the body the dead body does not rot. And then there are more sediment layers accumulating above the animal's remains, uh, like minerals such as silica, a compound of silicon and oxygen, which slowly replaces the calcium phosphate in the bones. If it is an animal, the calcium is completely replaced by silica. So the bone now becomes a rock-like substance. Then the third important thing is movement. Movement of the tectonic plates or the giant rock slabs that make up the Earth's surface, it lifts up the sediments. So when the tectonic plates move, the sediments move upwards. Okay, so it comes almost to the soil, clo closer to the surface. So it becomes easy for discovering these fossils. So that's how the fossils are discovered. So when there is erosion of the uppermost layer of the uh, Earth, the erosion from rain, maybe from rains, rivers, or wind. It wears away the remaining rock layers, rock layers, and eventually erosion or people digging for fossils, or if there is some construction work going on, that will expose the preserved remains. So that is how we come across that fossils. Fossils are found in such and such a place. So once a fossil is found, people get interested and then look for more and more fossils in the same place, digging and then trying to carefully and then trying to find more fossils. So this is how the fossil is found. So there are also what are called as petrified fossils. As I said, the entire, uh, say the entire animal is converted into a fossil. So there is no missing bone or missing uh, part of the, of the fossil. So a petrified fossil is, the, uh, it, it means the whole animal is turning into a stone. Animal or a plant or a tree is completely turned into a stone. It is petrified. So. Uh, it, this is the uh, it's a famous fossil that is there in the Museum of Chicago, Tyrannosaurus rex, which is again a carnivorous dinosaur. Now, petrified fossils form when minerals replace all parts of the organism, all are part of an organism. So the entire animal becomes uh, solid, it becomes a stone. Water is full of dissolved minerals. It seeps through the layers of sediment to reach the dead organism. And when the water evaporates, only the hardened minerals are left behind. And so the entire animal is now fossilized. But again, this may take millions of years. Then the second type of fossils is molds and casts. This is the mold fossil, an imprint 
or an imprint is an extinct mollusk called ammonite, which is, which is a uh, sea mollusk. A mold forms when hard parts of an organism are buried in the sediment, such as sand, silt, or clay. And the hard parts completely dissolve over time, leaving behind a hollow area which the, with the shape of the organism. So the, only the shape of the organism is retained. And a cast fossil is an ammonite cast. This is an ammonite cast discovered in the United States. I also have a, a specimen I'll show you after this talk. A cast forms as a result of a mold and the water with dissolved minerals and sediments fills the mold, um, uh, the empty spaces in the, in the mold and minerals and sediments that are left in the mold make a cast. The whole thing becomes a complete cast. The whole thing, uh, organism now becomes a complete uh, solid organism or, the, or a rock-like uh, structure. So the cast is the opposite of a mold. Mold is just a print. The cast is the entire organism becoming uh, uh, a fossil. Now the third one is carbon films. Uh, it's very common with many insects and also plants. The fern fossil, as you see, is a carbon uh, fossil, carbon film fossil of a fern, which is more than 300 years, 300 million years old. You, we know that all living things have the element carbon, that's why we call it as life, okay? So that when an organism dies and is buried in sediment, the materials that make up the organism break down. Uh, so eventually only the carbon remains. So you can actually see that the prints are actually the prints of carbon that is there. The thin layer of carbon left behind can show the organism's delicate parts like leaves of a plant. So the entire shape, including the venation, everything is retained in the fossil if a leaf is fossilized. So that is the carbon films. Then the last one is the trace fossils, uh, which is nothing but the, the work created by the animal. Like the, supposing if a dinosaur has walked on a, on a molten rock, and the rock has solidified later, the shape of the dinosaur's footprint is remained. Uh, it, it remains. So this, this is in Namibia, a dinosaur footprint that, that is found. So trace fossils show the activities of the organisms. So how the or organism was active or what it was doing. An animal makes a footprint when it steps on sand or mud, or it, that, that, is, that is retained, undisturbed, and later on, it, that, becomes a, uh, that itself becomes a uh, fossil remain. And over time, the footprint is buried in layers of sediment, then the sediment becomes solid rock. Now, this is the fossil nest of a bee that is found in Argentina. So this is, again, the work of a bee, the nest that is constructed by a bee, a solitary bee. And you see the cells that are there, which is the, this particular species uh, constructs nests in the soil, and the nest is now preserved as a fossil. So this is dated as about 65 million years old. Now the preserved remains are some organisms get preserved in or close to their original states. Uh, one of the ways in which the, 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 the entire organism is preserved is in amber. An organism like an insect is trapped in the trees, sticky resin. Amber is nothing but, uh, it is formed by the resin that is produced by many, many species of plants. So the insect gets caught in this resin and then when that becomes amber, over millions of years, the, the, the whole insect is preserved inside this. We will again discuss about this, how it happens and all that. Then another way of preserving the entire animal, even the large animals uh, are preserved is tar. An organism such as a mammoth is trapped in a tar pit and dies and then it remains as it is. And the, uh, the bones uh, are prevented from decaying and the whole structure, it remains as it is. And, and similarly, ice, an organism such as a woolly mammoth, dies in a very cold region and its body is frozen in ice, which preserves the organism, even including its hair is preserved, hairs are preserved. So these kind of fossils have been discovered in many parts of the world. Now there are six ways in which plants and animals fossilize. One is unaltered preservation, like insects and plant parts trapped in amber, a hardened form of tree sap. 
So this is unaltered preservation. Then the second one is permineralization or petrification, in which rock-like minerals seep in slowly and replace the original organic tissues with silica, calcite, or pyrite, forming a rock-like fossil. It can preserve hard and soft parts. Most bone and wood fossils are permineralized fossils. Replacement uh, fossils, an organism's hard parts dissolve and are replaced by other minerals like calcite, silica, pyrite, or iron, or in other words, the entire organism is converted into a rock-like structure. Again, carbon, carbonization or qualification, in which only the carbon remains in the specimen, other elements like hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are removed. Then the fifth one is recrystallization. Hard parts either revert to more stable minerals or small crystals turn into larger crystals. And the final one is orthogenic preservation or molds and casts, which we already discussed, molds and casts of organisms that have been destroyed or dissolved. Now, most animals naturally do not fossilize. Most animals did not fossilize. All those animals which died, all those plants that died, they might not have fossilized. They simply probably decayed and were lost from the fossil record. Paleontologists estimate that only a very small percentage of dinosaur genera that have ever lived have been or will be found as fossils. So they, they might have missed many species of animals, many species of plants that never fossil, that were there on this earth, but they were never fossilized. Now, <clears throat> very simply uh, to show how the fossils are found, to take the example of a dinosaur which dies, the dinosaur dies, let us say, and then there is quick burial of the dinosaur's body in the mud, sand, etc and it encases the body in the sediment. Now, supposing if it happens, there is a chance that the dinosaur can become, that this dinosaur which has died can become a fossil. If not, the dinosaur rots and no fossil is formed. It is eaten by other organisms and no fossil is formed. Now, supposing if it is bur buried in time, then do conditions exist in which the fossilization, recrystallization and or permineralization processes can occur. This involves the right temperature, right pressure, acidity, chemical composition of the sediment, moisture levels, etc. So there are so many factors that are involved for a dead body or a dead animal or a plant to become a fossil, to get converted into a fossil. So if these conditions do not exist, again, the body rots and no fossil is formed. Now, supposing if these can, all these conditions are there, then the minerals seep into the bones over time, the original bones decay and are slowly replaced by rock-like minerals, or one mineral is replaced by another, or empty spaces are filled up with minerals and the fossils are formed. And this takes several million years for a dinosaur which has died to be converted into a fossil. Okay. Now, I'll give examples of fossil insects because I like insects, I am an, being an entomologist, but many of these things happen for all organisms also. The, 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 the way the fossilization occurs, it may happen for many other organisms, including plants or plant parts. Now, the three ways in which insects fossilize, one is amber, or you may find in insect fossils in rocks, you may find ecology or the work of insects, okay? So first we shall discuss about amber, how the ambers are found. Now, um, you all must have seen the famous film, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park, in fact, was written in 1990 by Michael Christen. This was a, supposed to be a fiction in which uh, Michael Christen writes that an amber, a, a mosquito was found in an amber, okay? He finds, a, a, a scientist finds a mosquito in an amber and this mosquito, he finds that, he extracts this mosquito out of the amber and he finds that it has fed on an animal and the, there is blood inside, inside the uh, stomach of the mosquito. And he extracts- Sir, you are- Yeah? Yes, sir? Hello? Hello, anything? 
ஹலோ ஹலோ ஷுட் ஐ கண்டினியூ டாக்டர் கான் ஹலோ Shall I continue? Sir? Hello. Sir, yes. Any, any problem? Yeah, I don't know. Suddenly, there was an internet loss. Now, okay. yes. Uh, shall I continue now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. Yeah, yeah I was telling about the uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, Jurassic Park was a very famous film. it is a very famous uh, film a science fiction film that it was written by michael christen michael christen in fact he writes that uh, a scientist finds a amber and inside the amber he finds a mosquito and when he extracts this mosquito out of the amber he finds that the mosquito has fed had fed on uh, an animal there is blood inside that and then he takes out the blood and then extracts the dna from the blood and that is the the way in which he reconstructs the dinosaurus and all that that means the mosquito had fed on a dinosaurus blood on a dinosaurus and then he had taken it had taken the blood from the dinosaurus and then so he reconstructs the uh, the dinosaur so that that is a story of jurassic park so that means to say the full organism is um, say in, in, is encapsulated in the in the amber and the full organism can be taken out from the amber also okay so what is this amber millions of years ago there were huge forests that covered vast tracts of earth some trees within the forests exuded a resin from their trunks and branches these were the ancient amber trees even now there are many trees which produce resin like this and the number a number of theories have been proposed about why these trees secreted so much resin amongst them some of the reasons are the resin may be produced as defense against fungus or insect attack for desiccation control via resin covering the leaves and barks and an aid to reproduction by attracting insect pollinators because there are many insect pollinators which collect this resin to build their own nests reaction to storm or weather damage and a process that is linked to growth whatever the purpose the resin would collect in layers on the surface of the trees or fall into pools of hardening resin at the foot of the trees so it will it will drop down and then remain at the bottom of the trees now this is only the first stage in the transformation of resin into amber the process by which resin changes into amber is very complex the fresh resin gets buried in the soil or gets into an anaerobic environment to prevent its oxidation oxidization over the many millions of years that follow a slow chemical change would take place in this whatever the resin that is collected slow evaporation of polyethylene terpenes occurs polymerization of resin molecules start and on completion of this process the resin becomes amber again this whole thing takes as i say several million years now amber can be found which has retained the original shape in which it was formed one of these forms are called stalactites in these cases the fresh resin has dripped from the tree branch or the root of a tree in the in a cave and gradually set in a stalactite formation like a pencil it will be so this these are very common 
um, ambers that we that we get. So how insects get into amber? When the resin was first formed, occasionally ends, an insect got trapped or enveloped by the falling resin. The trapped inclusions are preserved with remarkable level of detail. This is a resin and in which you see some ants are trapped and might be, uh, these ants might be walking on the trunk and a resin drop comes down and then it traps this and then it falls down and then it remains. And ultimately the whole resin becomes a, a amber and the ant is inside inside that. So this is this is a centipede which is caught in a, in a, a resin which has become an amber. So these trapped inclusions are preserved with remarkable level of detail. You can even identify the species completely in the, in the amber because the whole organism is trapped inside. Now, there are many different types of inclusions. You will find uh, flies, spiders, pseudoscorpions, cockroaches, termites, leafhoppers, beetles, ants, wasps, bees, and many, many, many organisms, including some small uh, lizards also are caught in the uh, amber. So some research, researchers claim to have extracted valuable DNA that has been preserved over millions of years within the conserved tissue of some insect inclusions. Like if you go back to the Jurassic Park story, the, the Michael Christopher writes that DNA was extracted from the insect and also from the blood that the insect, the, the, the mosquito had taken. So that, that, is, that was the beginning of the, the story. Uh, but there is a twist to the Jurassic Park story. In fact, in the film, whatever the uh, amber is shown, whatever the mosquito that is shown, mosquito um, fossil that is shown, is a species called Toxorhynchitis rutilus. And interestingly, this particular species is not a blood, was not a blood feeder. So this was an error in the Jurassic Park film when, when it was done. And this has been... Um, shown only in 2013, about uh, maybe about 20 years after the, the film was made. Now, the next one is the um, fossil insects in rocks. So insect fossils in the rocks are formed, uh, the chances of preservation are directly related to the degree of mineralization of the uh, skeleton. In insects, you have sclerotization or hardness of the exoskeleton, it is there. And there are many insects with hard wings, like tegmina of cockroaches, the wings are hard. Then the beetle wings are also hard. So these are very commonly found in uh, uh, rocks in, in, in the, as fossils. So chitin is the principal compound in the insect cuticle, but chitin is not preserved in the uh, in whatever the fossil insect fossil that we find, because there is what is called as diagenesis that happens to the chi chitin. That means it gets changed. The chemical, physical, or biological change that undergoes by a sediment after its initial deposition. So the chitin, the original structure of the chitin gets changed. So you may not find chitin in, in the fossils as, as a chemical. So another factor that favors preservation of insect remains is their habitats close to or farming parts of a sedimentary paleo environment, such as lakes or lagoons. So many of these fossils are usually found very close to lakes or lagoons or rivers. Okay, so that is, that, that is a place where sedimentation process can happen, where the body of an insect or body of an animal can be easily covered by sand. And later on, over several years, the sand or particles may ultimately become solidified or they may be there, there is rock formation in the same place, so the, the layers get moved. So the, this is a, a cockroach wing fossil from Russia, which is dated as 285 to 245 million years old. And this is another um, butterfly, which was uh, which is a, a dated as 210 to 145 million years old. Then comes the work of insects or ecology. So insect paleoecology deals with the insect trace fossils that are preserved in sedimentary rocks, plant remains, and other less frequent substrates such as bones and vertebrate caprolites, which are called so in the, in the, uh, within the body of other, other vertebrates. So these may be locomotion trails, cocoons of many, many insects, or the pupae, pupal remains of many insects, the pupal chambers of 
some insects like weevils and dermastids, then the damage that is caused by the plant, like the borers. When, they, when, a, when an insect bores into a tree, it makes tunnels and those tunnels remain as uh, fossils. Then defoliation, when, when, they, when an insect feeds on an insect and if that particular leaf, leaf that is damaged by the insect, it is fossilized, you can actually identify which kind of insect has damaged this. Then leaf mines, some insects actually mine into the leaves. They make mines inside, inside, the, inside the leaves. And you, when that leaf gets fossilized, you can actually see uh, or say which kind of insect ha actually has done this kind of mining. So nests of bees and wasps are very common. Many species of bees have been found. For example, all the information that we have on extinct bees from the Southern hemisphere is by their fossilized nests. There are several nests. So these are all the uh, nests of bees, fossil bee nests. Then there are some, some species of uh, uh, beetles, pu pupil chambers. So all these are fossils which were collected in Argentina. So this is the damage of a leaf, okay, leaf damage, traces of feeding damage on the, on the leaf by an insect. You can actually say that this particular leaf must have been damaged by a beetle, which is feeding on this insect. So the fossil stem of a, uh, in the fossilized stem in which you see the gallery is formed by a borer, a, a beetle, which is bored bore inside. Then you also get fossilized termite nest. So the termite nest is fossilized, so you can identify this is, this is a termite nest. So fossils are considered millions of years old. We know that they are millions of years old, and they are measured in what is called the geological type scale. So we do not say in, uh, the number of years or decades or centuries, we use millions of years. So how the fossils age is determined is the next question. So before that, the geological time scale, how it is uh, determined. So International Commission on Stratigraphy under the International Union of Geological Sciences, it actually develops certain strategies, certain ways of methodologies for finding the geological time scale in which you have to identify the global boundary stratotype selection points and using the fossil records and the age of rocks and the global standard stratigraphic ages, GSSAs, are determined based on the age. That is how you, you actually use the uh, criteria for dating the rocks and also the fossils. And this is mainly based on the magnetic alignment sequences and radiological criteria, etc. This may be the paleontologists will be able to explain you better. So, in, in short, uh, the entire thing come, uh, uh, can be uh, said in a few sentences like this. About 15 billion years ago, the hot universe matter with unimaginable temperature. Then about 10, approximately about 10 billion years ago, there was this mass expanded and exploded and galaxies started getting separated, forming. Then stars and their planets were separated. Then about 6 billion years ago, the Milky Way galaxy got released, which is our galaxy. Then 5 billion years ago, Sun and other members of the solar system originated. And about 4.56 billion years ago, Sun and its planets were born, including the Earth. So this is the entire universe of the, we can't say it as the world of whatever is happening in the, in, in the whatever is happening happened in the, in the past. So the time scale of Earth is divided into two major eons. One is the cryptozoic eon. Crypto means hidden and zoo is life. So that is 4,500 to 540 million years ago. So from 4,500 to 540 million years ago, we do not have any proof for or evidence for life. Though we say that life evolved 750 million years after the Earth was formed and about, seven, three, uh, about uh, yeah, around 540 million years ago, we see that the plants also originated, the first sea plants originated. The Phanerozoic uh, eon, Phanero means visible, zoo is life, so 540 million years to present. So these are the two eons, major eons on Earth, the time of Earth. So the eons are further divided into eras. Cryptozoic eon is divided into, divided into Archean era and the Protozoic era. Archean era, beginning or origin of the Earth, 
4,500 to 2,500 million years. Then Proterozoic era is the primitive life, 2,500 to 540 million years. Phanerozoic eon, uh, or the Paleo it includes the Paleozoic era, which is the ancient life, 540 to 245 million years ago. Then Mesozoic era is middle life, 245 to 65 million years. Then Cenozoic era is the recent, that is 65 to present, 65 million years to present. Now we'll come to dating to the fossils, how the age of the fossil is determined. Fossils are dated usually by determining the age of the rocks or the rock formations, because you know that most of these fossils are found in rocks. So if you know the age of the rock, you can actually determine the age of the fossil also. So there are two methods. One is relative age and the other is absolute age. Relative age is not specific in relation to another rock or fossil. Supposing you know already the age of a rock, and if you find the fossil in that rock, you can use, easily say that approximately this is the time in which you find this. For example, you can say that dinosaur is older than monkey. So it is not, it is very relative. It is not, you, you cannot say uh, very specifically that this is the age. In absolute age, it is very specific. You can very clearly say that if you find a fossil of a dinosaur, it is 75 million years old or with a range of that 75 to 65 million years or as I said, for the, for, for the fossil that was found in the Narmada banks, it is 99 to 65 million years old. So the relative dating methods use the rock layers, which are determined the, uh, to determine the relative age, like the, the assumption is the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the more recent rocks are, at the, are added later on. So if you have four layers of rocks, the oldest is the layer one and the youngest is the layer four. The relative mate, uh, uh, dating method, we also use what is called, and they also use what is called as the index fossil. Uh, for example, if you have an authentically dated fossil of a plant or, or an animal, for example, this is a trilobite. We know that the trilobite live, uh, uh, lived between 530 to 251 million years old. Now, supposing if in the same strata, if you find another fossil, you can very easily say, along with a fossil of a trilobite, you, you can say that this particular species or this particular animal or plant also lived around the same time. So this is a relative dating method. So in the relative dating method, the strata, these are the earth strata at various layers. So you find the trilobites here, you find the di dinosaurs. So you say that you can very easily say that trilobites are much older compared to dinosaurs, and dinosaurs and nautilus, which is a uh, sea uh, mollusk, they almost lived around the same time. And you find the human fossils, hominid fossils, much later. So we are much recent compared to dinosaurs, and the human skull is found much, much later. Okay, so this, this is a very relative method of dating. Now, coming to the absolute dating methods, there are four methods. One is the radiometric dating or radioactive dating. Then the second is the fission track dating. And the third is paleomagnetism. And fourth is amino acid dating. Of these, radiometric dating is the most often used. So this depends on the radioactive decay of certain elements. One element breaks down or decays to become a different stable element. So an unstable element is there that becomes a stable element after breaking down. The unstable atomic nucleus loses its energy by radiation. That's why it is called as radioactive uh, decay. An element containing unstable nuclei is considered radioactive. There are, about, in the, in, we have about 118 elements of these 38 are radioactive elements. So depending on the fossil, depending on the rock, we can use any of these 38 radioactive elements to determine the age of the rock or the fossil. So radiometric dating, dating is based on radioactive decay. That is spontaneous release of energy and or, or particles from the nucleus of an unstable atom, referred to as the parent, to become a stable atom, which is referred to as the daughter atom, is radioactive decay. So an unstable atom is becoming a state, is getting converted into a stable atom. So it may be a different element or it may be a, a different isotope of the same element. 
the rate of decay occurs at a specific and constant rate. So this, this is very, very important because for each element, it has, or each isotope of an element, it has a specific rate of decay, specific and a constant rate of decay. I'll come to that. The age of the rock can be determined by measuring the amount of the daughter product and adding that to the amount of the remaining parent material. Supposing if there are 1,000 atoms in the beginning, and if you find 500 atoms in the, um, uh, of the daughter, daughter atom, that means that is half of it has, getting, has got converted into uh, uh, the daughter atom. So that is the half life of the atom, of the unstable atom. So that, that is how the age is determined. So four standards are necessary for elements to be useful in radiometric dating. One is the numbers of the parent atom and the daughter atoms must be measurable. You should be able to measure that. So the parent atom must decay rapidly enough to produce measurable amounts of daughter elements. So once you collect it, you should be able to see how, how even if it, it is a fraction, what is the rate at which it is decaying or it is releasing the uh, uh, energy. And measurable amounts of parent element must also be present in the sample. Little or no daughter element must be present. Oh, yeah, no, Hello? And the sample used yeah, must yeah. be chemical. Yeah, was... Hello? Yes, sir? Some disciplines from participant. Okay. Yeah. I muted. The sample used must have been chemically isolated from outside chemical changes. So these are the four requirements. Now, the most important thing is we have to determine the half-life. We should know the half-life of the element. Half-life refers to the length of time required for 50% of the parent material to decay to become the daughter product. As I said, if there are 1,000 atoms, uh, for it to become a, a, to, uh, a if 50% of that, if 500 uh, atoms are uh, have co got converted into the daughter element, so that is that is the half life. So further half life is this 500 atoms becoming 250 uh, uh, atoms. So that is that is the second half life. Then the third half life, the fourth half life, like this. So depending on the total amount of atoms that are there, the half life is determined. Now, uranium-235, uranium isotope-235, the half-life is 710 million years. So uranium, to lose half of its atoms, uranium-235, it, it takes about 710 million years. Uranium-238, half-life is 4,500 million years. Thorium-232, half-life is 14,000 million years. Rubidium-87, half-life is 47,000 million years. And all these elements are used as a most mo most commonly used for dating rocks, which are older than 100 million years. Okay, so that th these are the elements that are used. Now, potassium 40, the half life is 1,300 million years, and this is mostly used for uh, fossils or rocks which are more than 60 million years old. Carbon C40, the half life is only 5,570 uh, years, and this is used for fossils which are older. Um, uh, or less than 50,000 years old to a few hundred years old or more recent fossils. Now, uranium-235 gets converted to lead-207 in 710 million years. So half of uranium-235 becomes lead-207. Lead-207 is a stable atom, stable element, and that the lead-207, if half of the uh, say the material that you have got is lead 207, you can say that it has already spent 710 million years. Uranium 238 becomes lead 206 in 4.5 billion years. Thorium 232 to become lead 208, it takes 14 billion years. Rubidium 87 to become strontium 87, it, it takes 47 billion years. The half life is 47 billion years. And potassium 40. Uh, to become ar it becomes argon 40 in 1.3 billion years half of them it becomes argon 40 then carbon 14 it becomes nitrogen 14 in 5570 million years so these are the half life that that means half of the atoms of these uh, elements getting converted into these elements so by comparing the parent element with the daughter element you can actually determine they actually determine the 
uh, the age of the fossil or age of the rock. Then the next thing is fission track dating in which the uranium-238 and uranium-235 are present in the same sample. These two uranium isotopes always occur in the same ratio in nature and they undergo, the 238 undergoes uh, spontaneous decay and fission. Each time this happens, a tiny damage or crack is created and you can measure this crack by, by etching it with, with acid, whereas 235 does not undergo spontaneous fission. So you can make the 235, induce your, your 235 to undergo uh, th this kind of, uh, create this kind of tracks. And by counting the number of induced tracks and knowing the neutron, neutron dose, the uranium content can be determined. And from the ratio of natural fission tracks to the uh, whatever is created, you, they actually, the sample's age is determined. Then the next one is paleomagnetism. At the time of their formation, iron-bearing rocks and sediments acquire natural remnant magnetism. So the primary magnetism aligns parallel to the existing magnetic field of the earth. In a sense, a rock becomes a compass when, when it is being formed. And the orientation of the magnetic field of the earth at any point on earth is specified by two measurements. One is called the declination or the direction and the another is inclination. So inclination varies from horizontal at equator to vertical at the poles. And today the magnetic field is directed downwards in the north hemisphere and upwards in the southern hemisphere. Now Earth's magnetic field periodically reverses its polarity. Once in every 300,000 years, the magnetic field is reversed. So the rocks that were formed earlier, that would have captured the original magnetic field. So in the time of reversal, reversed polarity, a compass needle would point south. These reverses make excellent markers in the geological record. So the age of the fossil can be determined by correlating the position of the strata of rock where it was found and where a reversal has occurred. So this, that, is, that is one way. Then the amino acid dating is based upon the principle that amino acids which make up the proteins change when an organism dies. The proteins produced by an organism when it is alive almost entirely consists of amino acids in a left-handed configuration. So when the animal dies, the proteins change the configuration to right-handed configuration. This process is called as racemization. Now in fossils, an equilibrium ratio is eventually reached. So this equilibrium ratio can be measured to determine the age of the fossil or when, the, when actually the uh, organism died. So once the absolute date of the, of, for a region is determined, using radiometric dating and the temperature history of a region is established, amino acid dating can be used to determine the age of the fossil. So because this depends on the conditions that were there, the temperature, uh, that was that was existing at the time when the organism died. So of the four methods of dating fossils, radiometric method is the one that is more frequently used and it is supposed to be the most uh, perfect one. Now I'll tell uh, a little bit about the mass extinctions, just two or three slides more. History of life on Earth is punctuated by periodical extinctions of organisms in significant numbers. Now there have been five mass extinctions on this earth. Cam Cambrian or Ordovician and Ar Ordovician in the between Cambrian and Ordovician, 86% of the species went extinct. That is around 444 million years ago. In the late Devonian period, 75% of the species went extinct about 375 million years ago. Then in the Permian extinction, which, which happened about 250 million years ago, 96% of the species went extinct. And in the end of Triassic, 200 million years ago, 80% of the species went extinct. 80% of all the species that were existing at that time went extinct. And the end of Cretaceous, 65 million years ago, 76% of the species went extinct, including the dinosaurs. Okay, so these are the five mass extinctions which, which happened. And there is a belief that we are now progressing towards another mass extinction. So we are, we are waiting for the sixth mass extinction. So I think that is, that's all I wanted to tell about the uh, 
uh, about fossils. I will show you a few fossils and I also want to tell you something about my team. This is my team, my team of students who work with me on various aspects of pollination, pollination studies. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Khan, I'll show you, uh, show some of the fossils now. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this, I hope is visible. This is the fossil of an ammonite, which I collected myself uh, in, in uh, Nepal. I got the base of Himalayas. This was collected. Oh, okay. This is, the, this is a rock fossil. An ammonite, it is, a, it is a mollusk. Okay. So this is also a very interesting thing. This is a sea mollusk, which is found in the base of Himalayas, which also gives a proof for the continental drift, how the uh, Indian continent was moved and then it um, dashed against the Eurasian continent to form the uh, Himalayas. Okay, so that is, that is how the, you, you find a lot of sea animal fossils in, the, um, in, in that place, in, in base of Himalayas around Nepal. Now, this is an amber, okay? Can you see the uh, insects inside that? They are termites, okay? So you can see the termites inside the, uh, inside the amber. So there are some more uh, ambers, like this, this is another one with a small insect inside, inside this, okay? Then this is another fossil where you see that the entire organism is converted to become a rock-like structure, a cast. I was talking about cast, cast fossils. So this is how it, it forms. Okay, so these are some of the things that I wanted to show. If there are any questions, you're welcome. So the first question is, yeah. maybe the planet Earth population was very dense and uh, the loss of diversity is a very age-old process. Of course, yes. Extinction, yes. extinction is a normal During thing. Of, yeah. During the course of time, we have lost so many things. Definitely. Today we are saying yeah. uh, that uh, the extinction, I mean to say, they, they are becoming rare, endangered, and uh, so many things we are telling. So this is a process... Uh, from long time, whatever eras you have told, whatever the time periods yeah. you have told. So this is a very old process that we are losing the things. Exactly. Now maybe the thing is... The Darwinian concept may be uh, applicable. Of course. Those who struggle, they will survive and those who don't, they will be losing. Yes. Uh, the thing is, with the anthropogenic activities, now I think we are... Um, yeah, probably we are increasing the speed of extinction. Rate or rate, we are increasing the speed of whatever the natural process was there. Natural process exactly. was a little bit made fast because of yeah. our uh, activities and our yes. uh, say whatever uh, we are. Uh... So one question, one question has yeah. come from a participant: Are uh, the fossils shown are petrified fossils? Yeah, these are they are petrified fossils only. These are these are smaller animals. Petrified fossils you normally see. Uh, in case of higher animals, these are this. This is a mollusk, where it is completely converted into a fossil. Maybe after its death, probably it was uh, under the under several layers, and then the when when the uh, molten rock, it is probably it was caught, and then when the rock completely solidified, the the whole organism also has become a completely rock rock like structure. So that is how petrification. The, uh, the thing I have noted from the today's talk is. Yeah. The plants are uh, able to produce uh, some components yes. which are even going to remain for years together. Yes, and millions of years. Yes, sir. They, amber they are is, also helping to yeah. make the fossil. Yes, exactly. Plants are so, I mean to say, which uh, plant, can you, I mean to say, any specific plants are going to produce such a kind of uh, resin or... Uh, yes, sir. There are many, many species. Many Cisalpinaceae, I think they produce this uh, kind of uh, resins. Yes. There are there are many, many species. I think you should be in a better position to tell that uh, there's resins. And in fact, resins are actually collected by several species of bees. There are water water... Oh, oh, oh. Sir, please. Sir, ambers are secreted by mostly pine, sir. Only pine plants. Pine species. Pine. Yeah, pines. Of course, pines also. Right. I think they were the ones which were there long back. I think they were. 
well yeah. known for this production. Correct. Basically. You are right, sir. Yes. So, so the present day plants, I was telling, even you, there are several other species which produce these resins. And for them to, for that resin to become amber, it may take several million years. That is the, that is the thing. So no such organism and no such, I mean to say, thing is there which can uh, decompose the resin pr product. Yeah, I, I, was, I was telling that there, there are some insects which use the resin, they collect resin from the plants for building their nests okay for because it is a safe thing you no know, nothing can enter into the nest so they they use this uh, resin some bees do this so they are they are called as resin bees they actually line this resin with to their to their cells yeah, yeah quite interesting it looks yeah. So first time I heard amino acid dating is also done. Yeah, that is. Carbon that. dating, the radioactive decay and all. I heard. No, I am not very important. confident about those techniques and all that. Maybe if you can invite a paleontologist, maybe he he will be able to present. Uh, but present uh, talk was very when to say it has covered so yeah. many aspects. Thank you, sir. Really, all the three speakers from uh, GKVK are the encyclopedia. Really, oh, oh, that, that's too much. All of them because all teachers are wonderful teachers. And uh, it is a fortunate that we could get the I hope, you, and students, and could yeah, get I the hope the participants enjoyed it. Yeah, all uh, everybody is writing in the chat box very informative, very like uh, everybody is very happy for this. Yeah. All talks really, uh, you have given such a wonderful explanations from you, pollination sir. to insects, and uh, then also you have uh, quantified the uh, economic value of the pollination services. Yeah. That was wonderful job. Actually, you have, I mean to say, even uh, told in how many crores, uh, but, uh, yes. say, how much benefit they are no, doing if for. You have, uh, if, you have to, if you have to talk to the policy makers like IAS officers or the ministers, you yes. should tell in rupees. Yes, yes. yes. What is the, see, they say that they are mere insects, but the mere insects are giving us crores of rupees uh, without any charge from us. They, they don't charge anything, anything to us, but. Uh, doing their own job they are doing so much for us that is the thing we have to keep on thinking uh, that uh, how the what is a invaluable small insects are uh, not valued by the humans but still they are doing so much service to mankind yes, so except man everybody is honest i mean i, yeah. I learned from the thing is uh, the only uh, creation on the world is man who is not honest towards his services but all, I mean to say, plants doing their own job, producing nectars, I mean to say, after fertilization, how they change their, I mean to say, signals, yeah. and so many things. In, I mean to say, they are not able to talk, but they do things prompt, yeah, seasonally, periodically. Everything is uh, such wonderfully designed uh, creation, actually. So, really, sir, it is uh, very hard to uh, uh, express our gratitude for your information, what you have given. Thank you, sir. But uh, still, it was wonderful, and uh, we will be again inviting you for some more in future events uh, yeah. based on your consent and availability. So, we have learned so much that uh, we should appreciate the nature and we should appreciate the creation, uh, yeah. creator of this whole universe who has been designed so much well uh, architecture. So, with the great heart, I thank once again that you have yeah. given time for us. And you have taught us so many things. Really, we need to polish ourselves by listening to all the three lecture, I mean, the three uh, speakers from GKVK. We need to improve ourselves. We have to work more on our I mean, say, skills. And we should try to uh, convey the subject, how uh, interest is created by the... This refresher courses are mainly... Uh, the, the intention is to uh, create a, a more and more uh, uh, zeal in the teacher. So this justifies uh, by your talks. Thank you so much for wonderful uh, talks and uh, giving us time. So thank you again with your permission. Uh, if there thank are you. no participants thank asking you. questions, everybody. So yeah. I will all the best. I'll end the meeting for all on and all. Dear participants, please join back again in afternoon. We have again two more lectures in afternoon.